Hello and welcome to the Military History Club's Great Battle in 10 Minutes feature. Today I'm going to be talking about the Battle of Waterloo. The battle was fought near Brussels in the Netherlands, modern Belgium, on the 18th of June 1815 between the French army of Napoleon Bonaparte, who had recently escaped from exile and returned to power as Emperor of France, and the Anglo-Netherlands army of the Duke of Wellington. At the time of Napoleon's escape from exile in March 1815, the Duke of Wellington was acting as British plenipotentiary to the Congress of Vienna. I don't entertain the smallest doubt, he told Foreign Secretary Lord Castlereagh, that if unfortunately it should be possible for Bonaparte to hold at all against the King of France, he must fall under the combined united efforts of the sovereigns of Europe. Napoleon did hold against Louis XVIII, who, by the 20th of March, had fled from Paris and crossed into Belgium. But Europe was united in its determination to depose Napoleon by force, and Wellington was soon offered an accepted command of a 114,000 strong polyglot army composed of British, German and Dutch-Belgian troops in the Netherlands. Unconvinced by the quality of the Dutch-Belgians, some of whom had recently fought for Napoleon, he mixed them with his more reliable British and King's German Legion troops. But even the British troops contained many recruits, the majority of veterans either having been disbanded or sent to fight in America, and he was concerned about their effectiveness. I've got an infamous army, he complained in mid-May, very weak and ill-equipped, a very inexperienced staff. He added with reference to the staff, I'm overloaded with people I've never seen before, and it appears to be purposely intended to keep those out of my way whom I wish to have. The Allied strategy was for the armies nearest to France, Wellington's and the slightly larger Prussian army of 116,000, to hold their ground until the Austrians and Russians had arrived in force. Then, together, they would crush Napoleon once and for all. What Wellington was not expecting was for Napoleon to take the initiative. Blücher and I are so well united and so strong that the enemy cannot do us much mischief, he told a friend on the 8th of May, 1815. On the 3rd of May, he had met Blücher at Tourlemont, 25 miles east of Brussels, to discuss strategy. They agreed to a line of demarcation between their two armies, the Ligny to Maastricht Road, with Wellington's to the left and Blücher's to the right. They also agreed, in the event of a French advance, to concentrate their armies on either side of the strategic crossroads at Quatre Bras so they could support each other. As long as they remained in contact, they did not believe they could be defeated. Napoleon's only hope, given the huge array of force against him, was to defeat Wellington and Blücher before the others intervened. To that end, he mustered a 124,000 strong army of the north and prepared to launch it at the junction between the two allied armies in Belgium, hoping to defeat one before turning on the other. That he almost succeeded was chiefly down to allied errors, particularly those made by the Duke of Wellington. The first and most serious error was strategic. So convinced was Wellington that Napoleon would attempt to cut off his retreat from the Channel ports by advancing along the Mons axis, that he ignored all the intelligence reaching him in Brussels prior to and during the 15th of June, that the main French attack would be against the junction of the two Allied armies in the vicinity of Charleroi. On the 15th itself, repeated messages reached him that the French were attacking the Prussians in force at Charleroi. Only by 10pm on the 15th of June, did he finally accept the truth and order his troops to move towards the prearranged concentration point at Nivelle, including the Dutch-Belgian troops in Quatre Bras, a move that would have uncovered this vital crossroads if they had been obeyed by the local commander. Fortunately, they were not. But they would have to wait for daylight to advance, and this was far too late to assist the Prussians, who had to face the main French attack alone at Ligny on the 16th. Wellington acknowledged this error shortly after midnight on the 15th of June, when he remarked to the Duke of Richmond, Napoleon has humbugged me by God. He has gained 24 hours on me. Napoleon had been given an opportunity to drive a wedge between the two Allied armies and to defeat them one by one. He almost took it and, 
But for an error by Marshal Ney, who countermanded Napoleon's order to send one of his corps to attack Blücher's vulnerable right flank, the Prussian army would have been destroyed at Ligny on the 16th of June, and Napoleon free to turn on Wellington without fear of interruption. While the Prussians were being defeated but not destroyed at nearby Ligny, Wellington's men, particularly Picton's 5th Division, narrowly fended off a major attack by Marshal Ney and a wing of the French army at the Quatre Bras crossroads. It was not until 9am the following morning, 17th of June, that Wellington heard of Blücher's defeat and withdrawal to Wavre, 50 miles north of Bray. Realising that his still unconcentrated army, he had 45,000 men at Quatre Bras and another 20,000 at Nivelle, was more vulnerable to attack by Napoleon, he ordered an immediate withdrawal to the heights of Mont Saint-Jean, a location his engineers had selected as a possible defensive position in the spring. A separate message arrived that morning from Neisenau, Blücher's chief of staff, explaining that the reserve ammunition might have been lost and that only one corps, the 4th, was definitely equipped to fight. Wellington's response was that he would accept a battle in the position of Mont Saint-Jean if the field marshal were inclined to come to his assistance, even with one corps only. Muffling wrote to Blücher to that effect. The rest of the day was spent withdrawing to the new position, with French cavalry and artillery harassing them as they went. The narrowness of the front that Wellington had chosen to defend, just two and a half miles, meant that he could fight in depth with a thin front line and plenty of reserve behind. Yet his dispositions were strangely lopsided, with the bulk of his troops on the right, a moderately strong centre and a weak left, from where he assumed the Prussians would come. This was probably because he feared an attack on his right flank and or an attempt to sever his lines of communication with the coast. He was much less concerned with his left because that was where he expected the Prussians to appear in support. But would they arrive in time? And would, moreover, the two keystones to his defensive system, the isolated strongholds of Hougoumont and La Haye Saint, hold out until then? General Picton was not convinced. I never saw, he remarked, a worse position taken up by any army. The opposing forces were roughly similar in numbers, 74,000 men, though the French had a large advantage in artillery, 250 pieces to Wellington's 160. Wellington should have enjoyed a distinct advantage in numbers had he not deployed 17,000 men away to his left at Al, where he feared Napoleon might make a flanking attack. It was an error that almost cost him the battle. Napoleon's original intention had been to attack at first light, but needing time to concentrate his scattered army and to give the sodden ground time to dry out so that he could sight his grand battery of artillery, he fatally delayed the first attack on Wellington's position until around noon. It was directed towards the woods next to the Chateau Hougoumont on Wellington's right, though an initial rebuffal caused the French corps commander, Rye, to commit ever more men in a series of attacks on Hougoumont itself that were only narrowly beaten off. Meanwhile, at 1.30pm, the 16,000 men of Delon's untested one corps attacked Wellington's weaker centre-left, with the huge columns advancing uphill in echelon from right to left. They caused an exposed brigade of Netherlands troops to break and run, and Delon almost broke through the thin crust of British troops beyond. But the combination of a counter-attack by soldiers of Picton's battered 5th Division, a charge that cost Picton his life, and a combined charge by the Household and Union Brigades of Heavy Cavalry, drove the French back. Unfortunately, the ill-disciplined cavalry charged pell-mell down the hill, cutting up some of the guns of the Grand Battery as it was being recited nearer the British lines, and many were killed or injured in a counter-attack by French cavalry, particularly Lancers. The two brigades were, to all intents and purposes, out of action, with more than a thousand casualties. According to one witness, Wellington was perfectly furious that this arm had been engaged without his orders and sent the survivors to the rear. Yet he must have known that the cavalry's actions had saved the day. One of the great mysteries of the battle is why Ney ordered a mass cavalry charge against Wellington's centre at 4pm. In fact, 
Recent scholarship has shown that Napoleon was responsible and the attack was supposed to have been coordinated with an infantry assault by Lobo's 6th Corps. But as word had now definitely reached Napoleon that the Prussians had reached the right flank of the battlefield and were in danger of attacking his right rear, he diverted Lobo to hold them off while he tried to destroy Wellington. A previous cavalry charge had done considerable execution in the vicinity of La Haye Saint, and he hoped the new charge by armoured cuirassiers would force a breakthrough, or at least weaken Wellington so that the Imperial Guard could administer the coup de grace. In the event, the attacks had little effect on the British infantry, who, skillfully handled by Wellington, simply retreated into squares that the French cavalry could not penetrate. The major crisis point of the day came at 6 p.m., when the farmhouse of La Haye Saint, sitting astride the Charleroi Brussels Road, fell to the French, after the heroic KGL defenders ran out of ammunition. Only 43 of the original garrison of 400 troops escaped capture. The consequence was that the French could bring up horse artillery and skirmishers to the ridge and fire directly into the British squares, causing considerable execution. One British square assailed in this way, the 27th Inniskillen Fusiliers, lost more than 470 men and caused its brigade commander, Colin Hackett, to plead with Wellington for relief. The reply came back, tell him what he asks is impossible. He and I and every Englishman on the field must die on the spot we now occupy. To shore up his crumbling centre, Wellington moved across troops from the right, including a brigade of cavalry and the Brunswick contingent. But it is doubtful they could have prevented a major attack at this point if Napoleon had ordered one. It was around this time that Wellington, having already lost most of the members of his staff to death and injury, was heard to say, God, bring me night, or bring me Blücher. He wrote later, The time they occupied in approaching seemed interminable. Both they and my watch seemed to have stuck fast. In fact, from around 7pm, troops of von Zieten's Prussian Corps had arrived to reinforce the weak left of Wellington's line, soon capturing the Chateau of Fichemont and the hamlet of Smoin as the French fell back. But their first appearance convinced Napoleon and his staff that they were part of the French force under Marshal Grouchy, sent to pursue the Prussians. It was this belief, wrote Tim Clayton in Waterloo, that decided Napoleon around seven o'clock to launch the remaining battalions of the guard in a final attack to break through Wellington's line. Moreover, he ordered his aides to spread the word that Grouchy had arrived and the battle was won. Unfortunately, Napoleon only had 14 of his original 37 battalions of Imperial Guard still available as the majority had been used to check the advance of the Prussian 4th Corps at Plans Noir. The attack began at 7.30 p.m. As 11 battalions of the Imperial Guard, 6,000 mustachioed giants, veterans of at least 10 campaigns, looking like pirates with their garish tattoos and gold earrings, advanced between Hougoumont and La Haye Saint. They were supported on their left by Derland's remaining battalions. For a time, the attack seemed likely to succeed, as unit after unit broke before the guardsmen. But the arrival of David Chassé's Netherlands Brigade, with its artillery, caused the right of the attack to stall, while the left was thrown back by a combination of the 52nd Light Infantry and Maitland's Brigade of Foot Guards. Now, Maitland, Wellington shouted at the crucial moment, now's your time. Up, guards. Make ready. Fire. As Napoleon's Praetorians fled down the slope, a cry arose from their astonished comrades. La garde recule. The guard is retreating. This in turn caused the remnants of Napoleon's army to break and run. Soon after, Wellington and Blücher met at La Belle Alliance. The field of battle was strewn with a scarcely credible 47,000 bodies. The French had suffered the worst, with 25,000 killed and wounded and a further 8,000 prisoners. Wellington had lost 15,000 men, the highest of his career in a single battle and the Prussians 7,000. It has been said that Napoleon had only himself to blame for losing both the Battle of Waterloo and his throne. There is some truth in this. He made a number of poor appointments, notably Marshal Sue as Chief of Staff, missed some critical opportunities, 
and grossly underestimated his opponents and their willingness to help each other. He thought, wrote a historian of the battle, that Wellington would not try to support the Prussians on the 16th of June, and he was wrong. At Waterloo, he thought the Prussians could not come to the aid of Wellington, and he was wrong. Wellington, by contrast, performed well at Waterloo by crisscrossing the battlefield, inspiring his troops, and moving reserves to the threatened sectors. I firmly believe, wrote one staff officer, that under any other man but the Duke of Wellington, even British valour would have been unavailing. But even Wellington might have lost the battle without assistance. In his dispatch of the battle, written in the early hours of the 19th of June, Wellington recorded, I should not do justice to my own feelings or to Marshal Blücher and the Prussian army if I did not attribute the successful result of this arduous day to the cordial and timely assistance I received from them. Later that morning, he wrote to his brother William, you'll see the account of our desperate battle and victory over Boney. It was the most desperate business I ever was in. I never took so much trouble about any battle and never was so near being beat. Our loss is immense, particularly in that best of all instruments, British infantry. I never saw the infantry behave so well. Within these two documents, written while Wellington's memory was at its freshest, lies the essential truth of the battle, that the Allies almost lost it and certainly would have done, but for two crucial factors, the timely arrival of the Prussians and the fighting quality of the British redcoats, who, time and again, plugged gaps in the line and push the French back. Thank you.